Does bacon cause cancer? We're going to explore this question later on, but for now, we'd like to welcome you to this introduction to evidence-based medicine, which will be co-presented by me, Selina Ryan Big, and my colleague, Linda Ware, Senior Fellow in General Practice at Cochrane UK. I'm the Communications and Engagement Officer at Cochrane UK, and Linda is a former GP with 31 years of experience in primary care. We have developed this session for sixth form students hoping to study medicine. This session is particularly relevant to you because evidence-based medicine is something that you may very likely be asked about during interviews for medical schools. However, we hope this session will also be of interest more generally. Lots of the content we'll be covering is about critically questioning information and advice we read and hear about our health, a challenge we're all faced with in our daily lives. Here's an overview of the questions we're going to explore in this session. What is evidence-based medicine and why is it important when making decisions about our health? How can we find out if a treatment is effective and safe? And why is it important to look behind the headlines? Selina and I are here to tell you about evidence-based medicine, EBM. So let's start with a definition. Evidence-based medicine is the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. This Venn diagram illustrates these three equally important components of EBM. In the yellow ellipse, we find best research evidence. This is where Cochrane systematic reviews contribute. Clinical expertise in the blue ellipse is all about the experience and knowledge of those who advise us on our health. And patient values, in other words, what we consider to be important for ourselves when we are unwell and when we are making lifestyle choices about staying healthy. Where the three elements overlap is the best practice of evidence-based medicine. Why do we need evidence? I'm going to give you two examples of medical interventions which had inadequate or no evidence to prove that they were safe and effective. In each case, the outcomes were tragic. Dr. Benjamin Spock was an American pediatrician whose book, Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care, has been read by millions across the globe. In the 1958 edition, he advised parents to put their babies to sleep on their stomachs. His reasoning was that if a baby were to vomit, he or she would be more likely to choke if placed on his or her back. In 1989, Peter Fleming, a researcher working in Bristol, made the association between cot death, that's sudden infant death syndrome, and babies being put to sleep on their fronts. A campaign in 1991 called Back to Sleep advised parents to abandon Dr. Spock's advice and lay babies on their backs in their cots. In 1989, there were nearly 1,500 cot deaths in the UK per year. Now there are around 300. Dr. Spock's original advice wasn't supported by any robust clinical evidence. Thalidomide was developed in the early 1950s in Germany as a drug to aid sleep. It was found to be very effective at treating morning sickness in early pregnancy and was available over the counter from pharmacies in Germany in 1956 and on prescription in the UK in 1958. It was withdrawn in 1961 when it became apparent that it caused serious abnormalities in the developing fetus. It's difficult to know precisely how many babies were damaged by thalidomide, but it's widely believed that 10,000 were born worldwide and that fewer than 3,000 survive today. Many babies were still born or died shortly after delivery. Why wasn't this anticipated? Because when the drug went through early testing on laboratory animals, none of these was pregnant. And so its potential to cause serious damage to the developing fetus was not appreciated. There are now very strict licensing regulations governing how a drug must be tested before it is available to be used. 
The two tragic examples you've just heard about are particularly extreme demonstrations of the need for evidence. We'd like to talk through another example now, which we hope will illustrate just how relevant evidence-based medicine is to all of us. Even in the day-to-day -day choices we make about our health, we all have to make choices about our health. And when we do, it's important that those decisions are well informed. There is perhaps no more relatable example of a common health problem than the common cold. Symptoms of which may include a blocked or runny nose, a sore throat, coughing, sneezing, headaches, and or a high temperature. All of us will have probably suffered many colds in our lifetime. So we've probably all made choices about how best to reduce our risk of getting a cold and how to reduce symptoms when we do get one. Let's consider the evidence behind some of the choices we may make. On the screen, we've listed various remedies that might help prevent a cold or relieve its symptoms. Let's take a look at each of them. Vitamin C is a vitamin found in fruit and vegetables such as oranges, lemons and broccoli. Some people think that taking regular vitamin C supplements can help prevent a cold and that taking high doses at the start of a cold can shorten its duration. Vitamin D is important for our bone health and acts on calcium metabolism. It also has a role in our immunity. That's our ability to deal with infection. It's known as the sunshine vitamin because most of our vitamin D is produced through the action of sunlight on our skin. I'm sure you all know what garlic is, but might it be helpful when we have a cold? Echinacea is a herbal remedy, which we can buy in supermarkets and health food stores. Many people think it is effective at preventing and treating colds. Nasal steroids and antihistamines are both available over the counter for the treatment of hay fever. They help relieve an itchy, runny, sneezy nose. Perhaps they might also relieve the symptoms of a cold. Medicines containing a combination of oral antihistamine, decongestant, this helps dry up a snotty nose and congested sinuses, and analgesic, that's a painkiller, are very popular as cold remedies and can be bought from pharmacies and supermarkets. An example is Benlin day and night cold and flu tablets which contain paracetamol with a decongestant for daytime use and paracetamol with an antihistamine at night. Nasal decongestants, such as Sudafed blocked nose spray, help dry up a blocked nose and can be bought without a doctor's prescription. Antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections. Honey, I'm sure this needs no explanation but did you know that honey has been used in medicine for thousands of years? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are drugs such as ibuprofen and diclofenac and are used as painkillers. Vaccines. We get vaccinated to prevent us from developing an illness. Might a vaccine be produced to protect against the common cold? Steam is an old fashioned remedy thought to help clear sticky nasal and sinus secretions. And finally, paracetamol is a common painkiller. So why not take a couple of minutes to decide what you think might work to prevent or relieve the common cold? You are probably wondering how we came up with this list of treatments. What is it that links them? Well, each one has been the subject of a systematic review, which analysed all available clinical trial data to determine whether the treatment is effective and safe in relieving or preventing the common cold. We'll be telling you a bit more about how systematic reviews are conducted later on in this presentation. Only the six treatments highlighted in red have any evidence of benefit. This doesn't mean the others don't work, but so that there is no good evidence available to tell us whether or not they are effective and safe. Let's take a look at these six. Vitamin C seems to prevent colds, but only in people who do intense exercise, when it can cut the incidence by half. Regular supplements of vitamin D do help prevent upper respiratory infections, such as the common cold. 
Echinacea may be helpful in preventing and treating a cold, but its effects are very small. The combination treatment of antihistamine, decongestant, analgesic, and the antihistamines alone are effective at relieving the symptoms of a cold. But it's important to remember that everything we take may have unwanted side effects. So always read the instructions carefully and don't exceed the recommended dosage. Honey has been shown to help relieve coughs in children who have an upper respiratory illness, such as the common cold, and it improves their sleep. Here are details of each of the reviews which we highlighted on the last screen. Have a look at some of the systematic reviews online. The Cochrane reviews appear in the Cochrane Library and all have plain language summaries written in non-medical language. Here are some extra questions you might like to think about. Why might vitamin D be helpful in preventing a cold? Why are we all advised by Public Health England to take a 10 microgram vitamin D daily supplement in the winter months? Why would we not expect antibiotics to work to cure a cold? And why is it particularly difficult to produce a vaccine against the common cold? Cochrane, the organisation that we are a part of, is internationally recognised as representing a gold standard for high quality, trusted information about the effectiveness of healthcare interventions. Cochrane is made up of contributors from all over the world, researchers, professionals, patients, carers and people interested in health who work together to produce Cochrane Reviews. Cochrane Reviews are systematic reviews which collate and summarise the best available evidence on the effects of interventions to inform decisions about health. Cochrane is an independent, not-for-profit charity. We do not accept commercial or conflicted funding. This is vital for us to generate authoritative and reliable information, working freely, unconstrained by commercial and financial interests. If you'd like to find out more about Cochrane, please visit cochrane.org forward slash about dash us, where you can watch a three minute video about the organisation. We'd like now to give you some basic definitions of some key terms that we're going to be using throughout this talk. An intervention is usually undertaken to help treat, cure or prevent a condition. A treatment is medical attention given to a sick or injured person. A systematic review summarises the results of available, carefully designed healthcare studies. Let's talk through what a systematic review is in more detail. We may talk about Cochrane reviews and systematic reviews interchangeably. This is because Cochrane reviews are systematic reviews. The authors of a Cochrane review start with an important question about, for example, the effects of an intervention or treatment. An example might be, is paracetamol effective and safe at alleviating back pain? The review authors then search for and identify all of the relevant individual trials which have tested this question in order to bring the existing data together and evaluate the certainty of the evidence. Throughout, the authors use systematic methods and provide clear details of these. The authors then draw conclusions. Overall, when we look at the totality of the data, what can we conclude? Is the treatment effective? Is it safe? And how certain can we be of these conclusions? This would be an example of an intervention review, looking at the effect of a treatment, paracetamol in this case. But there are also other types of Cochrane reviews. For example, looking at the accuracy of diagnostic tests for a disease such as dementia. Cochrane doesn't give recommendations about which treatments people should and shouldn't take. Instead, Cochrane reviews aim to provide impartial evidence so that people can use this information in their decision making. We encourage you to go to this link to watch a three minute YouTube video it explains what a systematic review is in further detail. We're now going to play a three minute video which describes the phases of drug testing and what constitutes a randomised control trial. The story of a medication before it gets to the shelf of a chemist is a long one. Less than 10% of drugs designed by pharmaceutical companies actually end up making it onto the market. 
That's because most don't pass all the hurdles on the way to being approved for sale. Before a drug even comes near being tested on humans, it's tested on animals. This first step helps scientists test the effects of the drug on vital organs and how toxic the drug is at different doses. Once this hurdle has been cleared, the drug must go through three phases of human trials, known as clinical trials, before it's approved for sale. Phase one is the first time the effects of a new drug are studied in humans. At this stage, it's all about safety. A small sample of up to around 80 healthy volunteers trialled the drug to establish its toxicity over a range of doses based on the results of the animal studies. If the drug is found to be safe, it enters the next phase of testing. Phase two of the trial process focuses on the benefits of the drug, whether the drug treats the target condition or minimises its effects. Several hundred patients with the condition are included in the trial sample, and if there's evidence of a benefit to patients with an acceptable level of side effects, the drug progresses to the third phase. Phase three is the most important phase of drug testing, and the last stage before drug developers seek approval from regulatory agencies, like the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia or the Food and Drug Administration in the US, before it goes to market. Phase three is where researchers seek the definitive answers on a drug's efficacy and safety. The number of participants involved and the duration of the studies vary depending on the product and target condition but hundreds or even thousands of participants are often involved. And the best way of proving a drug's efficacy against the current standard of care is through a randomised control trial. Randomised control trials generally divide study participants randomly into two separate groups. One group of participants receives the new drug, while the other is a control group. They receive either no treatment at all, a placebo, which appears to be the treatment, but has no active ingredient, or the standard treatment available at the time of the trial. The two groups are randomly allocated to make sure that effects shown in a trial are the result of the drug itself, rather than factors like age, lifestyle choices, like whether the participants are smokers or live in a specific environment, or gender. And to make sure that effects aren't boosted or hampered by the patient knowing which treatment they're getting, trials are generally what's called blind. Where possible, the researchers and treating doctors are also blinded, so no one knows what treatment a participant is receiving until the results are in. Once the drug clears phase three, it generally gets a proof of sale and hits the market. But testing doesn't stop there. That's when phase four kicks in. It's the final safety measure on a drug and focuses on its long-term effects and potential use for treatment in other conditions or new populations, like children. These studies generally involve a wide population receiving the drug, sometimes thousands, and are often a condition of the drug receiving approval. So when you take medication, you can be safe in knowing that it's gone through a process of testing that can take up to a decade. Two key questions to ask about any intervention or treatment are, is it effective? Does it work? And is it safe? Cochrane's very own logo, shown here, is a representation of one of Cochrane's first systematic reviews on the efficacy and safety of a particular intervention. Specifically, that review looked at the efficacy and safety of giving corticosteroids to women who are at risk of premature labour. Premature labour is when a pregnant woman begins to give birth early, before the 37th week of pregnancy, which is when a pregnancy is considered full term. The question the review looked at was, do corticosteroids given to women in premature labour help prevent newborn deaths? When babies are born prematurely, their lungs may not be fully developed, and this can lead to respiratory distress syndrome, a life-threatening condition. Giving corticosteroids to women in premature labour could help speed up the process of maturation in the unborn baby's lungs. So, if research could demonstrate this intervention to be effective and safe, it could have the potential to save the lives of many premature babies. This was an important question because, although a number of trials had investigated this and had shown beneficial effects, the results painted a mixed picture. It wasn't until all of the data from these studies were brought together in the systematic review that the picture became clearer. Take a few minutes now to consider how you might design a randomised control trial to find out the answer to this important question. To help you, we'd like to introduce you to something known as the PICO framework. 
When researchers are developing a trial, they will use this framework to help them to focus the question they're going to explore. P stands for population. Who are the participants you are going to include in your study? You may think here about characteristics such as the age and gender of your participants, as well as important other characteristics you may wish them to have or not have. I stands for intervention. If you imagine you are running a randomised trial, you are going to randomly divide your participants into two groups. One group will receive the intervention. What is the intervention in this scenario? C stands for comparison. The other group of participants in your trial act as your control or comparison group. The comparison is measured against the intervention. What will they receive instead of the intervention? O stands for outcomes. How can we assess how well the intervention is working and how safe it is? Think about what we are hoping this intervention will achieve. In other words, what changes may we hope to see as a result of the intervention? and what potential unintended harms might we need to look out for. This will help you think about which outcomes we need to measure in your participants. Here is the PICO used to select trials to be included in the systematic review. The population chosen was women at risk of premature labour. The intervention, corticosteroids given to the mother before birth. Comparison a placebo, in this case, dummy injections, or no treatment at all. Outcomes, in terms of how effective the treatment was, the number of babies dying at birth, lung complications in the newborn babies, and other serious health problems associated with prematurity. In terms of safety, minor and serious adverse effects in mother and baby. Here we see the Cochrane logo again. In the centre, in pink, is a representation of the forest plot of the first systematic review which combined data from seven trials. The central vertical line represents where prenatal corticosteroids given to mothers in premature labour have no effect on the mortality of their babies. To the left of the line indicates benefit and to the right, harm. Each horizontal line represents a clinical trial, and the diamond at the bottom is the average of all the trial results. As you can see from the position of the diamond to the left of the line of no effect, it clearly indicates that giving corticosteroids to mothers in premature labour helps save babies' lives. But here is a reminder that life is never black and white. In 2016, in response to new research findings, Ian Chalmers, who was one of the founding fathers of Cochrane, wrote a blog warning of the dangers of giving corticosteroids to mothers in premature labour who live in low-income countries with poor health resources. In these situations, it can lead to an increased risk of maternal infection and a higher mortality rate in newborn babies. We're going to return now to our question at the very start of this presentation. Does bacon cause cancer? The choices that we make about health are not necessarily about treatments. They can also be about lifestyle choice and diet, for example. Every day in the news, on social media, in conversations with family and friends, we come across numerous health claims. It's important that we can question these claims and think critically about the evidence that lies behind them. We're going to think about these now in some detail using the example of bacon allegedly causing cancer. Here is an extract from a press statement released by the World Health Organization in 2015. It discussed the link between eating processed meat and the risk of developing colorectal cancer, otherwise known as lower bowel cancer. It stated that processed meat, such as bacon and sausages, was classified as carcinogenic to humans, group one, based on sufficient evidence in humans that the consumption of processed meat causes colorectal cancer. It went on to say that eating 50 grams of processed meat daily, which is about equivalent to eating two rashes of bacon, 
increases the risk of developing colorectal cancer by about 20%. Linda will explain what this classification means. The WHO has five categories in their classification of substances which may be carcinogenic, meaning that they can cause cancer. Processed meats fall into category one, where there is sufficient evidence to be sure that a link has been proved. Cigarettes, arsenic and asbestos are also in category one, alongside processed meat. Have a think now and imagine that you're a journalist writing an article about the information contained in the World Health Organization press statement. What would your headline be? You can imagine that you're writing for any newspaper you like, broadsheet or tabloid. Here is a genuine broadsheet headline that reported on the World Health Organization statement. It was published in The Guardian in 2015. What do you make of it? Do you think it fairly and accurately reflects what the press statement said? What do we need to know to find out the truth? You might take a moment to think about this. Here are some questions that Selena and I thought were important in helping us determine if a claim has been accurately reported. We're using our example of the Guardian newspaper headline about the WHO press statement on processed meat and cancer. What kind of studies provided the data? Were they randomised controlled trials, which are considered to be the gold standard? Or observational studies, which can identify a possible correlation or association, but not prove cause and effect? Who were the participants in the trial? Are they like me? If I decide to stop eating processed meat, might there be any harms in removing it from my diet? How do the risks compare, for example, between eating processed meat and smoking? Are we given information about our personal risk? What is the risk to me? Let's look at the last two points in greater detail. Firstly, how do the risks compare? The broadsheet headline we showed you a few slides ago would have us believe that eating processed meats and smoking cigarettes are equally risky. This is not what the WHO statement said. It gave no indication as to how the risks compare, only that processed meat and cigarettes are both class one carcinogens. In other words, they are linked to the development of cancer. As you can see from the data on the screen, Smoking cigarettes is much riskier than eating a bacon sandwich. Let's take a deeper look at another question. What is the risk to me? The World Health Organization press statement said that eating 50 grams of processed meat daily, about two bacon rashes, increases the risk of getting colorectal cancer by about 20%. But what does this 20% increase in risk mean to me or you? Firstly, here are a few different terms to understand. When we say risk, we're talking about the chance of something happening. It may happen, it may not. If we have specific information and can put a value on it, we can give a figure for absolute risk. For example, the risk of a heads when you toss a coin is 50% or one in two. Absolute risk is the actual risk or chance of something happening. An example would be a 5% risk of developing a particular disease in a lifetime, meaning that five out of every hundred people would be expected to develop it. Relative risk is a way of comparing risks to find out how much more likely one is than the other. For example, you could compare the risk in two different groups of people such as those who eat processed meat and those who don't, to see if belonging to a group increases or decreases your risk of certain illnesses. So, the figure we're given by the World Health Organization is a relative risk. It essentially tells us that a group of people who eat processed meat are about 20% more likely to develop colorectal cancer than a group of people who don't eat processed meat. However, we have no idea what it means for the risk to be increased by 20% if we don't know what our risk of getting this type of cancer is to start with. In other words, to work out what this relative increase of 20% means, we need to know what our risk is to begin with. 
As shown on this slide, we know that in general, the risk of developing colorectal cancer in a lifetime is approximately 5%, meaning that without eating processed meat, five in every hundred people would be expected to develop it. 5% is the absolute risk. So what does it mean when we increase this risk by 20%? Well, 20% of five is one. So if we increase five by one, the absolute risk goes from 5% to 6%. In other words, if five in 100 people who don't eat processed meat develop this type of cancer, six in every 100 people who do eat processed meat would be expected to get this type of cancer. Let's illustrate this another way. On this slide, you can see 100 stick people. These represent a group of 100 people who don't eat processed meat. The five stick people shown in red represent those people we would expect to develop colorectal cancer anyway. This is the 5% absolute risk. On this slide now, we have 100 stick people again. This time, they represent 100 people who do eat processed meat daily. This time, you can see that six stick people are highlighted, representing the six out of every 100 people within this group that we would expect to develop colorectal cancer during the course of a lifetime. The person shown in green, therefore, highlights the one extra person per every 100 people we would expect to get this type of cancer as a result of eating processed meat. When we look at the figures like this, it is perhaps not quite as alarming as the large 20% increase in risk may sound. With this information, that is, knowing the change in the absolute risk, we are able to make an informed decision about whether we want to change what we eat. This is just one example, but be aware, when reading news items about risk, more often than not, they will present the relative risk. This can't tell us anything about our own personal risk. Where can we find reliable, evidence-based health information? Here is a list of evidence-based websites do take a look. There are two books we'd like to recommend to you. Testing Treatments. One of the authors is Professor Sir Ian Chalmers, whom we've mentioned before and who was a founding father of Cochrane. This book outlines basic concepts of how to ensure a treatment is effective and safe. I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that by Ben Goldacre. This is a compilation of some of his Guardian articles on health, clinical research and Big Pharma. You might also like to investigate Cochrane Crowd, where you can take part in a Cochrane Review. No previous knowledge is required, and with regular participation you could work towards gaining Cochrane membership, and even have your name acknowledged on a Cochrane Systematic Review. We'd like to leave you with three key take-home points to remember when you next read advice on how to stay healthy or the latest treatment for a disease. Be sceptical. Ask, is a treatment effective and safe? And how good is the evidence behind it? Thank you. You can find out more about the talks that Cochrane UK run in schools on the Cochrane UK website.